I'm Alf, this is a beach, and today's episode of Alf Up a Tree is episode two in the Gender Recognition Act Debate Deep Dive series. If that sounded like a long, confusing sentence to you, you might want to go and check out the intro episode to get up to speed on the topic. If not, stay tuned, let's go. Today's subject is Lloyd Russell Moyle, who is the Labour MP for Brighton, Kemp Town. He had quite a lot to say about the GRA. Here's his first interjection, which he made to Elliot Colburn during Elliot's opening remarks. But would he also agree that sometimes it's important that we don't talk in big grand narratives mm. of our political beliefs one way or another? Mm. This debate is very specifically about the GRA mm -hmm. and the process of applying mm -hmm. and getting a GRC. Mm -hmm. And so actually colleagues shouldn't be having these big grand debates about mm -hmm. trans, feminism, etc. We should be talking about the practical thing that the GRA and GRC does, which is only two very practical things, mm -hmm. nothing else. It doesn't give you the rights for all, all other things. It only gives you two things, it changes, your birth certificate and pension mm -hmm. rights. And therefore we should limit the debate here on that and that will provide civility. Nice try, Lloyd. Um, saying that it only changes your birth certificate and is therefore no big deal is legally daft as hell when we don't actually yet know for a fact which rights will be affected and how. It may still prove that the legal sex on a person's birth certificate ends up being a decisive factor on a bunch of other rights that they might be owed. You will notice that Lloyd actually fails to follow his own suggestion in the rest of what he says as do all the other MPs in the session, and I would say good for them. The question here is not simple, the consequences are far-reaching, and they do all deserve to be discussed. When using changing rooms, and sleeping accommodation, or in prison, women and girls have a right to expect that there are no males also using those spaces. Self-ID could threaten these sex-based rights, and I agree with, my, with the Honourable Member that we are awaiting guidance on that, uh, and it could row back on decades of progress towards women's equality. I'm curious to know whether the Honourable Member supports the current GRA and GRC because, because what she's talking about in prisons already exists. People can have a GRC, but they are not automatically put in the estate that the GRC, they're not automatically put in the estate, and I can give you numerous examples. They are put in depending on an assessment by the prison uh, authorities. What's wrong with the current situation where the prison authorities make an assessment regardless of the GRC? Oh dear, that'd be false. For more details on this, see the prison section of episode one. The long and short of it is that in England and Wales, contrary to what Lloyd says, prisoners are, in all cases, automatically placed in the prison that matches their legally recognised gender. In Scotland, they have a policy based on trying to put every male prisoner that says he's a woman into the female estate, even if they don't have a GRC. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, look, I think we've got to start with this debate, and actually I agree with some of the things that, that my honourable friend opposite, uh, we sit on the same committee of constitutional affairs together, you know, we work positively together. I agree that the debate has become toxic, and I agree that actually we need to find a way forward, and we need to show leadership. But I think we need to also step back mm. and work out why there was a call initially, now over four years ago, for there to be changes. By a call, what Lloyd means is that Stonewall, a very well-funded and indeed taxpayer-funded lobby group, was successful in lobbying the government for a consultation on GRA reform. That's the call. Describing it in language like that, in my opinion, it kind of hides the institutional nature of where it came from and makes it sound more like an authentic democratic urge. It wasn't necessarily. And that call was because the current Gender Recognition Act and Gender Recognition Certificates were not working. OK, that's your opinion, although your opinion presupposes both that the Gender Recognition Act ought to exist and that it ought to work a certain way both radical feminists who would like to repeal the act and old school transsexuals who are happy with how it is now would disagree. They were not working because at the time the WHO, this is one of the reasons, was going through a process of removing gender dysphoria as a registered diagnosis. As this year, the World Health Organization no longer recognizes gender dysphoria as a legitimate diagnosis that any doctor in the world should be giving. So this little section that's coming up took me 17 browser tabs deep and about six hours reading to unpick. Let's go at it piece by piece. What Lloyd's talking about here 
is that the World Health Organization is indeed updating its International Classification of Diseases, the ICD, from version 10 to version 11. And they have in that process made some changes to various uh, diagnostic categories that are relevant to transness or the trans experience. In the ICD version 10, there were five different uh, clinical diagnoses listed under gender identity disorders in a chapter on mental health. In the ICD-11, the new version that has come out this year, that has changed, the terminology they now use is gender incongruence, and that is placed in a chapter on sexual health. Yes, it's now in chapter 17, conditions related to sexual health. So ICD-10 was Gender Identity Disorders, ICD-11, is Gender Incongruence. That was the change in terminology that the World Health Organization made. Here's the kicker. Neither the ICD-10 or the ICD-11 explicitly mention gender dysphoria. That term doesn't appear in either. So no, it's not true that the World Health Organization has ceased recognizing gender dysphoria as a term or as a diagnosis because they never did. Lloyd could counter-argue that I'm being pedantic by looking at the explicit term only and missing a deeper point in the definition, but I'm not. If you have a look at the definitions, and I recommend you do, in the ICD-10 and the ICD-11, the old version, the ICD-10, has transsexualism as one of its gender identity disorders, and that is defined as a desire to live and be accepted as a member of the opposite sex, usually accompanied by a sense of discomfort with or inappropriateness of one's anatomic sex. In uh, the ICD-11, they changed the term from transsexualism or gender identity disorder to gender incongruence, and they define that as being a marked and persistent incongruence between an individual's experienced gender and the assigned sex, which is basically the same thing, right? So really, the change between these two versions is just a superficial bit of window dressing, mostly done to remove some terminology that a certain group of trans rights activists didn't like. We're going to come and have a look at exactly how that happened shortly. We now require our doctors to break WHO guidelines to continue to abide with the Gender Recognition Act. So this is just all kinds of wrong. Um, firstly, doctors aren't obliged to abide by the Gender Recognition Act. They are obliged to abide by their own clinical and ethical codes. If they think that they can make an appropriate diagnosis, they can make it. They don't have to make it because a piece of law says they do. That's problem one. Problem two, as we just spoke about, gender dysphoria as a term didn't appear in the ICD-10 either. So if Lloyd's having a grievance there about the terminology changing and the NHS not keeping up, then that should have applied all the way back in 2004 when the act came out. The ICD-10 was live then. A third problem crops up when we look at the NHS's actual definition of gender dysphoria. They define it as being a sense of unease that a person may have because of a mismatch between their biological sex and their gender identity. So they do explicitly mention sex, but they don't outright name it as being a mental health disorder. In other words, the NHS definition doesn't really fit either in its terminology or in its substance with either of the World Health Organization definitions that are in question. And there's a fourth problem, and we got right down into the weeds on this one. If you have a look on the NHS's SNOMED CT system, which is a tool they use for keeping all their clinical language consistent across the whole group, um, they appear to recognise gender dysphoria and gender identity dysphoria and gender incongruence as all being synonymous with gender dysphoria being the preferred term. So if a clinician is calling something gender incongruence, as per the new ICD-11 that Lloyd would like us to abide by, the NHS's internal clinical vocabulary system accepts that as a synonym of gender dysphoria. Confused? So this whole thing just looks like a really weird, confected complaint. He's basically griping that the World Health Organization made a substantive change to their diagnostic criteria when they just didn't. And he's saying that the NHS are having a kind of issue with that in that their criteria for gender dysphoria fit with the old version and don't fit with the new version, when actually they don't really fit with either version. And in addition to that, the NHS's internal clinical tools seem to recognise all these things as being synonymous, which they are. That alone, that alone, not talking even about the barriers to getting a Gender Recognition Act, 
the social problems, the issues and the trauma that it causes for people, the fact that it maybe doesn't actually properly reflect um, you know, kind of the lived lives and the biology, because it only reflects actually the mental health diagnosis. Putting all of that aside, the very fact that we in this country are now requiring our doctors to give a diagnosis that is no longer internationally recognised should mean that we change the act, even if it's changing the diagnosis and what, they are, what a doctor or what a medical professional is looking at. Well, that's fascinating. So for starters, I'm not at all happy with this notion that MPs ought to be changing medical diagnoses. Maybe let's leave that to medical science as an idea. As we just mentioned, this whole point is confected anyway. The NHS's definition didn't agree with the previous one or the current one. So there wasn't this step change that Lloyd seems to be attempting to attach importance to. But there's something really interesting we can get into looking at the broader structure of what he's saying. So the broader structure there is that the Gender Recognition Act ought to be changed to fit with World Health Organization guidelines. Okay, He thinks that the GRA should, in its terminology, be subordinate to the ICD-11. Yeah. So why did the World Health Organization actually make these changes? Why did they cease to consider these trans-related diagnoses as being mental health disorders and change the various bits of terminology around in there? It turns out that in 2011, a group of activists calling themselves a Global Action for Trans Equality convened, gathered together a set of like-minded activists, basically, successfully got the ear of the World Health Organization, had meetings with them, and were able to persuade them to make certain changes. They had a shopping list, basically, of stuff that they wanted to see gone from the ICD-10, and that all went. They got all of that. In that meeting, something that the activists present thought was extremely important was that any changes that they were able to influence the World Health Organization to make, quote, must be legally valid in those countries where a specific diagnosis is required to access legal gender identity recognition. So, in 2011, the TRAs at GATE thought both that it was reasonable to lobby the World Health Organization to change their stance and that any changes they were able to instigate ought to be compliant with the GRA. Fast forward 11 years, and now we have Lloyd here making exactly the opposite argument, that the World Health Organization is a trusted authority whose stance ought to be deferred to, so much so that we should now rewrite the GRA to comply with the new World Health Organization ICD-11 terminology. So which is it? If the World Health Organization is such a respectable authority, then surely back in 2011, the trans rights activists at GATE should have shut up and accepted the ICD-10 diagnostic categories in the first place. If they're not such a trusted authority, and lobbying them to change their stance is reasonable, then why should we defer to that stance without a lot of serious questioning about why they hold it? This pattern is, unfortunately, one that trans activism has become well known for to quietly lobby respectable organisations behind closed doors with the aim of getting certain concessions. Then, elsewhere, point to those concessions and go, aha, it must be right because so-and-so says so. I don't know if Lloyd is knowingly complicit in this process, but he is certainly participating by making these weaselly and arbitrary appeals to his preferred authority. If you're going to then change the act, it is then incumbent on us to say, well, first of all, what would a doctor diagnose? Is it acceptable for it to be a mental health diagnosis anymore? So once again, it's really bizarre to see an MP weighing in on what the appropriate bounds of diagnoses might be. But the point he's trying to make here in the end is it's an arbitrary moral assertion about what things it's acceptable to think about trans-identifying people. While I would agree that there is unfair stigma associated with all mental health conditions, that doesn't mean that they aren't mental health conditions. It just means that we should do something about challenging the stigma. And as far as actual objective reasons why you shouldn't think of either gender dysphoria or identifying as trans as mental health problems, I can't see any. I think it's just that the activists find these terms icky, they don't like them, and they therefore want to distance themselves from the terms rather than address the unfair stigma that is attached to those terms. Or actually, are there other indicators that are more important? Someone's self-declaration, someone's evidence that they might uh, provide in that sense. Someone's self-declaration is not evidence. It's just an opinion. That's all. Someone's commitment to live in a particular way going forward. 
Two huge problems crop up whenever we hear these arguments about commitment to a certain way of life. First problem, can you define that way of life in a meaningful way without use to sexist stereotypes? Haven't ever seen that done. Second problem is that having a commitment like this potentially criminalizes future detransitioners. I don't find that at all acceptable myself. Maybe those are better indicators for how someone is living. Now, I'm happy to actually have a debate where some people might say, it might not be my position, but some people might say, well, we need to put some other indicators in there that are about how your neighbours or friends might have seen you, like you do with a passport photo um, when you, you get that signed off and it says it's a true likeness. This is a cute idea, but I don't think these two things are at all the same. Suppose I sign the back of my friend's passport photo and it's true, that really is his face. There's nothing that can actually go wrong there, is there? If I lie and I sign a wrong photo and help my friend get a fake ID, then I'm complicit in any bad outcomes that come out from that and would bear partial responsibility. By contrast, if I say that my neighbour really is woman enough for me, that's fine and dandy as far as our relationship goes. I'm all for people relating to each other however they wish to. But if I sign a piece of paper that gives my neighbour right of access to women's spaces, then I've just been complicit in giving away some of their rights without even so much as a discussion. Just a crap idea, Lloyd. I can understand why people might say, well, we want to make sure that there's um, a, you know, other documentation. But clearly the documentation that is provided at the moment is insufficient and doesn't work. We heard, um, I heard the other day, for example, one person that provided two years' worth of statements. In six months, it took to hear the case. The panel then rejected because they said the two years were six months out of date. It is a Kafkaesque kind of situation. You submit the documentation, the delay happens, so then they reject it. And so no wonder so few people then feel that they are enabled to submit. And in the end, they had to resubmit going, providing evidence effectively in the future, as it were, to be able to submit it and to be able to get them. So there is a problem with the system, and I think that is the starting point we have to come from. No, people can come from whatever starting point they want on this question. There are people that want things to stay as they are. That can be a valid argument. There are people that want to repeal the GRA. That can be a valid argument. And of course, these arguments in favour of reforming it should also be heard. I would agree with Lloyd that it's cruel to make people jump through weird and, as he says, Kafkaesque bureaucratic hoops. But Lloyd's preferred solution to that seems to be to just open the door and let everyone through, whereas I would prefer to probably remove that door, realising that it was a silly door in the first place. If you do that, all of this administrative issue goes away. And that is the starting point the government had. But unfortunately, they opened up a Pandora's box four years ago. Just to keep everyone up to speed on what it is that Lloyd is actually talking about there, he's referring to the government's 2018 consultation on potential reform of the Gender Recognition Act, where this ball started rolling. Where everyone's worst fears and nightmares could be ploughed in, on all sides of the debate and argument. And rather than showing leadership, they allowed it to fester. So this I agree with. The government have been really weak and inconsistent with their messaging, the combined effect of which has been a bit like dangling a carrot in front of the trans rights activists on the one hand, while simultaneously waving a giant red flag in the faces of gender critical people and radical feminists on the other hand, and then stepping back and going, fight! The results are inevitable. And now what's happened is a process of suggesting that they'll remove the fees Ignoring, of course, that you have to pay often for diagnosis, you have to pay for doctor's letters. It still costs hundreds of pounds and the barriers are rather high. I've got an idea for you. What if we bring the cost all the way down to zero by getting rid of this process altogether and then attending to the issues that the Gender Recognition Act was attempting to resolve via reformed universal human rights that a person doesn't have to do anything to be protected by? And then talk about going online might make it actually harder, not easier, for some groups of people. I think this lot are very, very online. So actually we do need to step back and look at that process. Because I hope that we all agree, whilst we might have different philosophical views on some of the other wider issues, that people should be able to, a minority of people, of course a small minority of people, should be able to change their gender from the gender that was assigned at birth. No, I would disagree with that. 
I don't think this process should exist at all because it's based in incoherence and it has a negative impact on other rights and laws far beyond the scale of the problems it was trying to solve in the first place. It also seems really disingenuous to be talking about a small minority of people that in your opinion ought to be able to do this when the reform that was being discussed this day was to let anybody that wants to do this. Which is it? And that gender will have been assigned at birth usually because of a physical, uh, um, sorry, because of a, a, a visual check, a visual check of that individual. No further, um, no further requirements of what goes on at birth certificate. And so means that many people will grow up feeling very different. It's not really clear to me what Lloyd is actually alluding to here. Maybe he thinks that there are other checks that could have been done to see if a child is trans at the point of birth. There are some people in the trans identifying community who hold to ideas like this, thinking that, for example, fetal exposure to testosterone is a big factor and that this can potentially influence a person's brain sex. Maybe you could discover that that was true of a newborn infant, but it's worth noting that those sorts of ideas are not at all acceptable to rank and file trans activists in the current political scene. The people that hold those ideas get referred to as either transmed or true scum, both of which are pejorative terms for people that think there is an important medical basis for being trans. As it stands today, the dominant narrative is only self-declaration is acceptable, and of course, a newborn infant is not going to say, I identify as whatever, at the point that their birth certificate is being made. Perhaps Lloyd would prefer it if we were doing the whole babies thing and we just put an X or something on every baby's birth certificate until later on they come to tell us who they are. I don't know. I don't like that idea. But I also think we should recognise that self-ID is a particularly difficult term. It's not particularly a useful term. Most of our gendered spaces are already self-ID. There is no law in this country on who uses the toilet. Mari Black made the same incorrect claim in episode one, so check out the section there titled Single Sex Spaces for more details. You could just about make the claim that there is a tiny shade of truth in what he's saying, in that there isn't a fully mature set of established case law to nail this point down one way or the other. Really all we're waiting for is for somebody to bring a claim for indirect discrimination against an institution or their employer saying that they feel uncomfortable using what has become a mixed sex changing room or toilet. The law exists to win that case. Quite right, yeah. because actually where they've been introduced in other parts of the world, they are a nightmare. And if there were, it would probably be, um, I would use the term cis-gendered women, but other people could use other terms that they prefer. I'm, I'm happy to have that discussion. But it would be, it would be women who tend to use the toilets um, in public events and go into the men's toilet when there's a huge queue in the women's that would end up getting criminalised if we did have laws that say it was a criminal act to go into the wrong gender toilet. Maybe I don't hang out in the same pubs and clubs as Lloyd here, but personally I've never noticed the gents being a popular destination for women in times of high usage. Normally, you're quite lucky if the one stinking toilet in the gents even has a toilet seat. Sometimes there's no door. On this hypothetical point of criminal laws barring you from going into the wrong sex toilet, it's a hyperbolic notion that nobody's actually asking for, and in real life it's just not that simple. What we actually have are anti-discrimination measures which oblige service providers to offer single sex toilets. That does not mean that it becomes a criminal offence to go into the wrong one. Rather, all that happens is you have breached the policies of that particular provider or institution. They might then ask you to leave or buy you from the premises or initiate some kind of resolution process with you. Further to that, a person might choose to sue a given provider for failure to meet their anti-discrimination obligations. And if they did that, that would happen in the civil courts, not the criminal courts. And the outcome would be on the order of fines and orders to correct the problem rather than custodial sentences. I'm not personally aware of any agitation on the gender critical side of the fence for new criminal laws to do with single sex spaces. All that people are asking for is for the existing civil laws to be respected. So clearly it would be, it would be bonkers to do, it would be stupid to do something like that. So most of those spaces are already self-ID. So we're only talking about a very small number of spaces that might need protections. And they are already in the... Um, uh, the, the current protections. Yes, they are already covered in the current protections and those protections are a lot more extensive than you might like to admit. 
Case in point right here. If by small number of spaces you mean every institutional and public toilet, changing room, etc. in the whole of the UK, that's a small number. I'd say that was a big number, but OK, what do I know? I'm not a mathematician. Now, it's quite right. We need proper, we need proper and better guidelines of how they should be interpreted. But those guidelines need to be written with the trust of all in the community. Yes, they do, including people who would like to keep their single-sex spaces. They need not to be seen as some political backlash one way or another, but they need to bring everyone on board. And that also means not trying to rewrite or undermine the progress that many people feel that they have already achieved. Really glad you feel that way. I'm sure all the feminist lot will be super chill now that they know that Lloyd isn't going to take away any of their rights. You can't suddenly take away people's live lives and their rights away from them. And for many trans people, that's what they feel that the debate is happening to them. They feel that there has been some progress and now people are trying to shove them in the box. I'm not saying that that's the intention of anyone. I'm saying that's how they feel and we need to address that and move forward with them. Lloyd is obviously of the opinion that the existing amount of trans rights is not enough and that more are owed whereas other people have the opinion that existing trans rights have gone too far and that less are owed. I'm probably in that second camp, especially when it comes to the Gender Recognition Act, although I do recognise that there is pain and difficulty and stigma and all sorts of other things that should be resolved, but probably in other ways. I would use the word positive declaration identification. Maybe that's too wordy, but finding a new word beyond self-ID is probably useful in this debate because what we're talking about is a legal process. That is literally just a pointless rebranding exercise. You could call this thing anything you want, right? You can call it the uh, positive affirmation, self-channeling, auto-maximalization process with extra bonus chakras and a free packet of cheese and onion crisps if that makes you happy. The reality of it is it's the same thing. What it actually is, is the legal sex of your choice on all of your legal documents with a significant detriment to women's rights served as a side effect. And then finally, I want to talk, uh, I want to say in the last 10 seconds, what is important is that we ensure that we have fairness in this country and we don't pit different groups together. This is not an argument about one or the other. Yes to fairness, 100% with you there. It would be really nice if this could not be an argument about one or the other, but some of the stuff that is at stake here is a zero-sum game. For example, the privacy clauses in the Gender Recognition Act are in conflict with my rights to free expression. More rights for GRC holders equals less rights for me. Similarly, single-sex spaces are on sketchy legal ground already in the presence of the GRA, and that situation would potentially get a lot worse if self-ID were brought in. The sorts of overclaims, misrepresentations and obvious bias that Lloyd has displayed in this speech make it very clear to me that those rights that he likes to pretend doesn't exist wouldn't be safe in his hands if he got his way. Behaving like this as a politician is, I would argue, one of the primary causes of the hostility that has developed between trans rights activists and gender critical people. So Lloyd, if you're actually serious about not wanting to pit people against each other, maybe start with having a look at your own behaviour. It would be much welcomed if you would actually listen to all the different voices and give them a fair hearing, and it would help a lot if you stopped participating in these kinds of deceitful prefigurative politics and other disingenuous strategies. And that's it for today's episode. Let me know in the comments if you've got any thoughts or suggestions, or you've got an idea of which MP I should have a look at next. Thanks very much for your time and see you next time.